This is the Ops Game Changers podcast, where we share real-life stories from remarkable leaders that are transforming the world of service operations in financial services, healthcare, and BPOs. In this series, we explore some of the key challenges faced by service operations as they strive to deliver more, more capacity, more productivity, and more business impact. In each episode, we delve into how these Ops Game Changers have addressed a key challenge or issue. Our guests share how they went about unlocking significant value, adopting best practices, and experiencing some game-changing results. Hello and welcome to Ops Game Changers, the podcast that shines a light on the crucial role operations teams have in driving business performance and improving staff and customer experience. My name is Pravesh Vigayu, I'm the CMO at ActiveOps, and in each episode I'll hone in on a key KPI or challenge that a business has solved. I'll delve into how they went about doing this, and explore the outcomes achieved. Now, today we're joined by Eleanor Bianco, who's Senior Leader Client Operations here at at CoreLogic, to find out how they evolved their automation strategy from being very rules-based some five years ago to now adopting sentiment with AI to drive operational efficiency. Now, before we jump into this automation story, let's welcome Eleanor to the show. So hello, Eleanor, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for jumping on the show. We're really excited to hear more about the automation story. Now, uh, before we jump into that, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how you ended up in operations. Oh, thank you. So probably not that um, interesting a story, but I I think it was the early or mid to late 90s um, where it was, you know, work was hard to come by in Australia. So I started just out in a call centre as customer service um, for a large telco and just moved around departments in there and and landed in what was then called business and government service delivery Mm -hmm. and sort of worked there for a while. And I just noticed after a while was, you know, some teams were always, always struggling and some teams were um, doing really well. And it just, it just fascinated me. And I just think from there, I learned, um, you know, I, I wondered and I was curious about why that would happen. And it was probably at the start of when the internet boom really, like it became, the internet was, a pro, it needed to be a primary service, not just phone and fax line. Mm-hmm. And the demand for internet services for business w- was exploding. And so, so many changes and we just need, we just couldn't keep up. Yeah. Um. So that sort of piqued my interest and I was really just attracted to the concept of you know, if I, and I now know that if you can measure it, you can manage it. At the time, yeah. I didn't understand that. And just how that change was managed and how that was impacting different teams. So that was that's how I got started and just progressed my career through different um, organisations within Australia, both telco and banking. Well, I mean, I think that's, a, a you know, a very common story when we talk to operations leaders all over the world. <clears throat> it's, it's often the case that you've grown up through the operations ranks. So, uh it's fantastic to have you at the show to to kind of talk through you know the automation journey. Now, um, before we we would jump into that specifically, perhaps just tell the viewers a little bit more about Core Logic. Who are you, and what's the role of operations for Core Logic? Sure. Um, well, Core Logic is at its core a business to business information mm-hmm. service provider with platforms that fuel property decisions in Australia and New Zealand. So we gather a lot of data and then we package that up um, for for people to make property decisions. Mm -hmm. So we really pride ourselves on our data and our services helping people build better lives. Um, And every team in every way um, has that connection to what we do. It's, you know, that's their unique way of delivering that. And it really does um, help the end user find a property, whether it's residential or commercial, um, acquire one through mortgage platforms, and then protecting through insurance um, data. So it really it really hones in on the property um, universe in Australia and New Zealand. So that's the core of what we do. Mm-hmm. And our service delivery or operation sits within client experience. Right. And our role really is to deliver on what the customer needs. So our platforms really do the bulk of our grunt work. Mm-hmm. So we rely on our platforms to present this information, to be up to date, and to really help these businesses um, 
make their decisions. Where that doesn't happen, where customers need help, that's that's the size of our operations. So um, we do that. And we also do a lot of the, the research of that data. So finding out more about data, finding out who, who's connected to certain um, projects that are happening within the commercial and construction real estate mm-hmm. segments in Australia. So that's that's primarily our operations within CoreLogic. But again, it really is there to support the platforms that we provide our data through. So, Eleanor, I guess when you're thinking about customer experience, then yeah, it drives some key challenges for your operations team. So could you share a little bit about the challenges that you face? Yeah, and I think we wouldn't be unique in the challenges that we face in having to deliver on customer, what, what the customers are asking for. But I think when I think about the challenges, I think my question, my answers would be very different had I been, like when I was a team leader, I would have said mm-hmm. absolutely it would have been SLA and KPI driven and I would have said it's about having enough resources um, to do that. But now as I've progressed and I sort of sit back and have a, a wider mm-hmm. scope to be worried about, I, it really is that balance, I think the challenges of – exceeding that client experience, making sure that they want to stay a customer of CoreLogic and by the same time enhancing our employee experience. Why do they want to work for CoreLogic? What are, what are they able to do? Because so many, you know, so many people now want to be connected to that purpose mm-hmm. of CoreLogic. And that other part of that triangle there is how do, how do you stay ahead of the technology so that you're not staying behind and that you are able to deliver our products faster and just keeping up with what's going on because you know to our customers they don't they don't really they're not interested in what's happening behind the scenes so how do you how do you balance those three key pillars daily and you just can't stop and I think the pace is the challenge that's how I would answer that question now yeah it's it's a very it's you know it's a very good answer and I think you know thinking about that pace you know when you you know when you first introduced yourself you talked about that pace of technology change yeah you know in um uh you know the the, you know the operations teams that you're working with at the time i guess in some ways we're experiencing that rapid change now it's it's constantly changing in fact it's probably faster than it's ever been um and that kind of jumps into the topic right so the idea of automation and you know automation i know is a journey that you've you started uh, probably five six years ago. Um, yeah. So, what were those drivers at that time? Why why did you embark on starting this automation journey? Yeah, I think foremost, and you know, if we're not shying away from that, was the the cost of the cost of the work we were doing. Mm-hmm. So we were able to work out how much time and effort we were spending on processing or data entry that it seemed like there weren't decisions needing to be made or the decision was quite easy right. and we would sit back and we would watch people and we would look at ways that we could reduce the time of the task we would constantly going if it's you know one and a half minutes how hard can it be um, for us to you know look at it or from the employee's point of view how boring is it for them to have to continuously do this all day every day mm-hmm. So we looked at what can we do? How you know we went to product and we said, can you stop us needing to do this? No, you know the queue. This queue of work was actually work that needed to be done. It was fulfilling. It was a fulfillment request. It wasn't a product initiated queue. And so we then had very brave executives at the time who said, let's see if we can automate this. And so it was a very small scale. We reached out and we and we targeted about three or four different um, processes that were we considered high volume low value so the decisions to to fulfill that task were, were easy right and that that's how we started so we we literally just reached out to a couple of suppliers um, they showed us some prototypes we we said yeah let's try this um, and it really was about how can we just not have this task? And we definitely needed people on the task mm-hmm. because around that time, the SLAs, or um, well, the turnaround time for that work was around 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine a 30-minute turnaround time if you've got a couple of people off or um, 
you know, lunch breaks. You know, that's how we had to, we were so timely, uh, we were so closely monitoring their time that it just, it was quite stressful, stressful for everybody involved. Okay. So that was the first one we looked at. It was a really easy process for us to um, to say, yeah, this is ripe for automation. And when we looked at these processes, it was, could we automate 85% of the work? We always right. knew that we're going to be exceptions and we were more than okay with that. Mm -hmm. Could we do 85%? And if it was yes, then let's have a look at that. So, um, yeah, that's that's how we started. And it really was rudimentary keystroke replication. We didn't look at redesigning the processes. That wasn't part of the scope. It was just, can we replicate what the team member is doing? Got it. So that's how we started. Fantastic. So, I mean, <clears throat> I guess... You know, it's again a very common story as to why mm -hmm. operations teams go down and you know and, and down a route towards automation, where it's all about you know yeah. hopefully reducing some cost and improving the customer experience at the end of the day. And as you say, a thirty-minute turnaround, mm -hmm. you've got a you know a very short window to make sure yeah. you deliver against a customer requirement. So you know, looking back, what do you think went well, and what would you say your kind of key learnings were at that stage? I think the what went well was the pro the process was quite easily mm -hmm. defined and mapped. So the process we started with was was quite. No, I don't want to say easy, but there weren't too many exceptions. There was one um, one system to to go on to, and the scope of success was quite easily defined mm -hmm. because we knew we could do eighty percent, and that eighty percent was successful. The the more difficult ones we didn't even. Uh, we didn't even try and that was still processed by the team. So that, I think the def the scope of the project worked well. We right. tackled what we should have tackled. Um, and the team really quickly, it caught on because that pressure valve was released. Mm -hmm. um, so it worked and it was successful. However, I think some of the, the key learnings were to ask, to, to make sure that you understand every process along the way. So even if you, um, we had a, a service provider that that did the development for us mm -hmm. to make sure you understand every, not every bit of code, but understand how they've designed or, or how they've, um, how they've delivered on what you've asked them to do. Mm -hmm. So even if you have a BA that can interpret the um, business requirements, actually understand how they've done it. Because if those people move on, you, you know, it's your business, it's your customer. You need to under, be able to understand that. So I would say ask questions and then really ask more. And the other one was, I, I think, looking back, is try and preempt as many things that you think could go wrong and mm -hmm. preempt them and be prepared for that. So if the product changes the logon page or moves a, a, a checkbox, that's going to impact of course. So try yeah. and preempt as as much as you can, um, if you can, because if you think it can go wrong, it probably it probably will happen, and be prepared for that. Yeah, and and I guess Eleanor, you know the we we you know we kind of hear it a lot at the moment with the whole AI revolution that mm -hmm. there is this fear for people's jobs, right? I mean, people are, are scared in some ways of bringing the new technology, like particularly you know the the, the new levels of artificial intelligence that are available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in some ways, even five years ago, five, six years ago, when you were starting this journey with automation, I would imagine it's the same sort of fear from your teams and people. Um, did you did you encounter resistance at that point? Did did did, you know, did your staff fear that, oh, my God, I'm going to yeah. lose my job as a result of this? Um, yes and no. I think the resistance came in the form of, uh, I want to say disbelief, like mm -hmm. there's no way you can automate this. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that comes from if a bot can do it, what am I doing? Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure if that's where the, the thing comes. Or, you know, it, even for me, sometimes I'm I'm so surprised at what is able to be done from a from a technology point of view. Yeah. In our instance, because the volume was so high and we have so many we had so many different teams with volume pressure. There was no talk of 
your job not being here. It was it was always around that reassurance that, hey, you're not going to be doing this, but there'll be this other work to do. Or this work's going to take away those repetitive tasks and yeah. what you'll be left with is the challenging work that we can't automate. The resistance, I think, uh, that in the beginning was maybe fear. It may be <clears throat> no one quite verbalised the fear. It was more of, I don't think a bot can do that. Yeah, it's not possible, right? Why? How? It's how, not possible. Yeah. yeah. Um. And and so when we, you know, when we asked, "Hey, can we watch you do a task?" Mm -hmm. it, there was always like, "See, a bot won't be able to do this because I have to go over here and do it." And you know, that's when we sort of looked at our mapping process and and changed that concept of not so much keystroke replication, but outcome focused what are we actually trying to do in this task why are we even doing this task yeah i mean i guess it's you know it's one of these things that's always evolving right it's never a static yeah. so yeah. you're constantly moving from um, the next operation or trying to tweak accordingly. Yeah. so you know and, five years yeah. five years on um yeah what's the perception now what's uh you know how how, how is this automation have you hit the 85 percent you know has uh, how how has this impacted the business yeah, I think when we look at certain processes and we really tackle some ones that have got a lot of decision points, um, it takes us longer to get to that 85. So that's our benchmark. We need to be able to do 85 for it to even be worthwhile for, mm -hmm. you know, the time to invest in the process and the developers developing it. Yeah, I think I think you make, you know, it's a, it's, it, you know, it's a key challenge for, any type of change really is well it's not going to work for me because my work is very complex and very different and actually a technology or a bot as you say or ai is not going to be able to do it and i think as you say the rate of change of technology is so fast and yeah. so advanced now that you know things like chat gpt as you describe are revolutionary in some ways and the mm -hmm. sorts of things that it's going to enable you to do so so i guess it it, it kind of brings us very much into today in terms of where mm. where you guys are today so yep. you know, you've been on this automation journey where you started with this kind of key keystroke you know the basic processes that you've yep. evolved and you're now you know certainly moving more towards adopting some more sophisticated technology to you know to deliver that sentiment and that yeah. idea of of you know tackling some more of the complex type of processes that you have Absolutely. so perhaps kind of to talk us through the sort of things you're doing today well, I think it is, before I just jump into that, I think it's really possible because the cost of this technology has come down. It's, it, it is accessible. Yeah, that's true. I think to to most people. So that gives us a bit of leverage to be able to be a little bit more courageous because it's not a huge um, financial commitment to be able to try. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at now is really more... Um, Report deliveries, so, you know, taking different pieces of work and creating reports for customers around property. Uh -huh. um, and we're looking at, you know, our e – so when we receive customer inquiries, having it run and presenting what they – you know, it would say, this is what I think the customer is asking. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, you can then say, yeah, here's – and it can give you suggestions about a response – Mm -hmm. And you can pick which one, which you can pick that response and it can say, hey, this is a formal response, this is a less formal response, this is a very casual response, which one do you want to select? So that's really exciting for us to be yeah, able to definitely. deliver, um, you know, that again, going back to that turnaround time saying exceeding that customer expectation, if they've got, you know, a customer wanting to list with them and you want to be able to make sure, you know, you're providing the best data for them. You don't want to wait four hours. Even four hours is a long time now. You know, in our in our banking and finance, four four hours is half a day. That's yeah. that's too long. So if we can if we can do that very quickly, um, you know, and that turnaround time is reduced to half an hour or an hour. That's what that's what we want to start looking at. Mm -hmm. Or even if we have a whole heap of documents and it can recognise that someone might have put something on there that's considered a personal document, like a driver's licence or a passport mm -hmm. photo. We don't want to have that information on our system. It could flag it and say, we think there's something here to, that you might want to remove. Yeah. That sort of um, that sort of 
speed and accuracy will be a game changer for us. Absolutely game changer. Without before, if we to do that, we would have had it had to add teams of people to be able to do that. Now we don't have to. So we can keep our workforce. Um, we can keep our existing workforce, not add to it, but deliver this exceptional customer service. So that's what that's where we're at, and that's the potential is is huge for us. <clears throat> yeah, when we think about AI and think about you know a machine doing something. Um, yeah. That's the biggest hurdle that we as individuals have to get through is whether we trust it, right? And uh, yeah. if we're able to trust it, then we would probably advance it. So I, I guess no doubt in in years to come that that will improve. But I think mm. we're in that phase right now for organisations where we're in that middle, right? It's we'd yeah. like to do a lot more. And we know the capability yeah. of it is to be able to do a lot more. Yeah. But actually, yeah. how much are we prepared to let it do it as well as trust it? And I think that's a really, yeah. really interesting challenge. Yeah. And it probably a, a, a period of time that we'll go through where yeah. we'll evolve. I, mean, I guess in some ways, very similar to your journey you started five years ago, where it was, you know, it's very simple and, and individuals, mm. uh, of course, a bot wouldn't be able to do what I do. And all of a sudden to yeah. now, you know, okay, we can take that to the next level. Um, yeah. So it's really exciting. So, I mean, what's your, um, you know, from a core logic point of view, what's the, you know, your view on AI? Because I know you talk about digital first, you know, human yeah. web methods. Is that, is that, you know, do you kind of see this, the uh, this whole evolution, something that's going to become more and more central to what you do? I, absolutely. So I think when we look at so we, you know, digital first, human web that matters is something that we act, you know, absolutely. Um, want to fulfill so as I mentioned in the intro our platforms and our products really do need to take the grunt work mm -hmm. of of helping people make decisions so when we say digital first it means if you need at any time of the day seven days a week you should be able to do what you need to do if at some point that's not possible and there are always exceptions we want to be there to be able to help you through that mm -hmm. Obviously, we can't be there 24-7, um, but during, you know, business hours, we want to be able to, we want to be there and help you through that. Cool. So almost like the agent, you know, the chat bot. Now, every time you go somewhere, you'll always start out on a chat bot. And if mm -hmm. it can help you, great. But if not, it's great when they can transfer you to somebody. Totally. But if there's no transferring to somebody, that's generally an experience you don't want to go through again and mm. in the back of your mind you think I don't want to uh, I don't want to I don't want to do that because mm. I don't know if I'm going to get a response so we have to be here to be able to deliver on those outcomes that a customer is looking for and we want to be there so if you want to go online and we want to be able to help you through a you know a, a, a knowledge article that says hey why is this value coming up a particular way or why is this valuation taking this long and there's an easy answer for you we want to be able to do that digitally yeah but if there's something more complicated that you need to talk someone through or explain something we will be there for you and that it's as simple as that so technology takes the grunt work and we'll be there to finesse whatever it is that needs to happen yeah, so, that's, a, that's a great way to yeah. describe it, actually, to be honest with you. I think that's, yeah. you know, us as consumers, if we put our consumer hats on, that's exactly what we yeah. want, right? We want to get our response sorted out as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, we're not that fussed how it, how it's done, as long as it gets done yeah. quickly, right? Correct. But you always look for that, you know, how many times have you been on a website when it, you haven't got the response and it says, was this helpful? No. And yeah. it takes you ages and ages. And then finally, you get offered up. Um, a, a human chat yeah. or a phone number so we don't want to make it that difficult for people of course yeah we want to make it we want to be there but by all means please help yourself first <clears throat> and you're right you know it's 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 actually a very difficult balance right because you know companies will go down that path that you've described and we've all been there as consumers where yeah. we're really frustrated that we can't contact the people the, the organization yeah because we're kind of going around the houses with these automated bots and call yeah. centers and so forth, yeah. and how frustrating that is for you as con us as consumers and yeah. the negative impact that has on a brand. Whereas, 
you know, and, and we all know that driver behind that is cost, right? In terms of yeah. most companies, it's about taking as much cost out as possible under the guise of we will, you know, it will make the customer experience better. And the reality in some cases it doesn't, right? Because the customers get even more frustrated. So it's a, yeah. a really, really challenging, but you know, challenging balancing act of how far do you push it where you know you still enable your customer to feel like they've achieved or had a great response or great experience as a result. So yeah. I mean that, that's quite interesting in terms of uh, the impact then. So you know you've been on this journey for you know, five, six years. You, you've obviously got more and more um sophisticated in the usage of of automation and, and AI as you are now. Um, what impact has it had on your customer experience? Have you seen any you know any positive signs around that? Yeah, so if I use an example in um, our banking and finance space, we were always struggling with the the reactive nature of of how we respond to customers. So, um, you know, a workflow would trigger something and that they would call us. So we've automated a lot of those cues, mm -hmm. which was, you know, easy enough to do because they were generally email responses. So we were able to do that and we were able to schedule it throughout the day where we needed to or even overnight for, um, you know, to capture everything that was happening in that day, we were able to do some at night. But by and large, we were able to keep on that throughout the day. And that freed up our team to be able to change from inbound to outbound proactive mm -hmm. and using that AI, looking at particular jobs that said, if this has had five interactions, we think there's something that we need to follow up here. Mm -hmm. So we created a queue that had, these are the jobs that we should be calling on. And we started that quite small by targeting our key clients, yeah. and we said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna do this for you without any, you know, we're just gonna see how this goes." And we start we started noticing that the inbound calls dropped because we were being able to be proactive. Got it. And then we were then able to talk to our suppliers and say, "This is how much proactive work we were we've been doing this month on your jobs." So then they had a benefit of saying, well, I don't want to be on that list. So they started using the system in the way that it's intended and keeping customers updated so they didn't need to call us. So it sort of had this flow on effect of by us being able to free up the capacity of the team by not having to send the reactive email and being proactive and saying, we're going to touch this before, it, we're going to get to this before they call us. And then feed that data back to the suppliers. Yeah. We've sort of created this continual loop of improvement. Nobody wants to be on that list. They don't want us to call them. But our benefit is that we're not then having needing people taking those inbound calls because they've got tight SLAs on those. And they're contractual SLAs and we have to make sure we hit them month after month. So that's sort of taken that pressure off. The team members enjoy the proactive because they get more control in their day on who they're calling. So we've changed it from taking getting an angry phone call inbound to making the proactive call on behalf of the customer before the customer's even asked for it. That's fantastic. Yeah. So that's been a huge change in the it, the pressures out of the team. Mm -hmm. you're in control, you feel like you're making a positive difference because you're calling before anybody's had to call. We can then tell the customer, hey, we've already called on these jobs. You don't need to call us. Yeah. It's an improved that it's, you know, that's where we say we've improved that customer experience. That's fantastic. That's really is a, you know, a very real use case in terms of yeah. the sorts of things that you've been, you've been able to achieve. Now, yeah. When we first talked about at the start, we talked about the, um, uh, you know, when you started the first part of your automation journey, we talked about people and, and the team. Obviously, you've had an impact on the customer experience perspective. Yep. And we talked about the idea that individuals thought, well, bots couldn't do that. So, you know, there's that yep. whole challenge around that. Now, with AI, AI that is much higher, right, in terms of the fear factor. Have you, have you seen anything with your teams or with your people? Have you done anything with the teams and people to bring them along this stage of the journey? Yeah, I think we've just, we've kept them abreast of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We've often needed their help in designing the workflow. So we've, you know, we've we've had to go to key people in the team and say, 
explain to me how you do it. Don't miss any steps so that we can capture everything. Um, but it's also they've noticed the relief. Yeah. And so we've been able to do things like career progression planning, mm -hmm. which before we probably paid a bit more lip service to than actually did. But got now it. we've got that we've got the capacity to be able to sit, go learn other skills or do some training or um, you know, have really strong conversations, not just about performance and productivity and output, but about you know, where do you want to go? Because we want people to stay at CoreLogic and we want them to have fulfilling work to do, not just data entry or, um, you know, repetitive work. And so they can see that benefit. They can see, well, you know what, some of our, some of our associates are becoming, you know, more relationship type okay. roles because we've been able to take away that, that work so whilst you know we're by no means near the end like we've still got quite a lot to do and you know look though that email automation is going to take a big chunk of of time to get you know right and progressed but we want to make sure people have are not just under pressure all the time because that just creates a lot of stress so I would say definitely has we've felt that relief and that the team have noticed that. So then now they're open to other ideas. So when we say, hey, we're going to, you know, this bot's going to, from your three dot points, going to write the notes and you don't have to write a full paragraph, they go, oh, okay. That's good. Easy. Yeah. yeah. So it's the things like that. We've, we've definitely been able to breathe a bit of life back in Um by having these bots work. so the, And they tell us now if it's not working. We think something's not working because our cues have gone up or they'll, they'll quite tell us. And they won't say in a way like, oh, I told you your bots weren't working. Um, <laughs> but, oh, no, they're not working. What's wrong? So it wrong? becomes part Please of the process. It. It, it, yeah, as you say, it becomes yeah. part of them, isn't it? The, the whole yeah, absolutely. process that you're into, which is fantastic. Yeah. It shows that the yeah. journey you guys have been on is one where yeah. you brought everybody along the journey with you. Yeah. And that's not um, like because people come and go. So new people come and they, they, you know, we have to continuously be on that journey. So I think it's you can the minute you rest and say, I think we've done it, you know, something will come and shatter that. So it's cool. that continue. You just continuously have to tell the journey, like stay the story. Why are we doing this? What what are the what is the purpose? Why do we want to invest time and money into developing these bots? It, you, it's you can never just rehash the same presentation. It has to be timely. It has to, you know, things change and we do and, and the bots can get better and better. So you know that eighty five percent could become ninety percent, could mm -hmm. become ninety five percent. So that that um that is just never ending. And I would. I also think from a business point of view, you know, we get new product managers and different products or we require new businesses. So to explain to the business as well that these this program of automation and optimization is not competing with anyone's roadmap, mm -hmm. but it needs to be complementing. And that's exactly the same for the team. It's not competing with you as a person but it's going to complement your role. So if you have, keep that in mind, it's not there to replace you as a human, mm -hmm. but it's there to take that repetitive task away. And if you want to keep doing that repetitive task, which I don't think anybody does, then, you know, you can, but as soon as you take that task away, they don't ever want it back. No one's no, ever course, screaming to do that ever. repetitive task <laughs> again. So, you know, I think it is just being open and honest um, at, about what, what you're doing and why you're doing mm -hmm. it. I think, Eleanor, you, it, it sounds like, you know, the journey you guys have been on at, at, at Core Logic has been very pragmatic and you've taken every step, you know, thinking through the impact that it has on your customer experience as well as your internal the staff <clears throat> so based on reviewing then where you you know where you started and where you are now what's you know what are you most proud of oh um 
I think that the program is still going. I think mm -hmm. easily we've, you know, some of those challenges, especially around the legal and the infosec and what happens with data. And um, I think that the program is still going is a testament to the support we get from our executives. And, you know, when an initiative takes a little bit longer to deliver some of the impact, I think other companies could have just said, nah, scrap it. Yeah, pull the plug. Pull the plug. But we're, pers you know, they've, they've persevered with us and, Every time there's a little win, it's celebrated probably more than than what it should. Mm -hmm. But it, it has built that concept of we're not going to rest on our laurels. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably different, you know, tying right back to that initial conversation about operations and how far we've come. Yes. Change before, 15 years ago, would have been we that's the way we do it and we're not changing that way. Um, but now I think – the no one is really okay with just standing still and even the our, our teams have had to be on that journey with us product has have to be with that journey with us that we cannot we cannot just keep doing what we're doing so even if we do have a process and we put a you know we put a bot on there and we develop it and it only we can only get 18 months of benefit and then something else happens that's okay yes if it doesn't have to be a long, it doesn't have to be a five-year plan. If we can develop it quickly, and we can we can spin up processes, um, as in as quickly as four weeks. So we you know we were asked, just I think in May, could we have something rolled out by June thirty in preparation for end of financial year, um, for some taxation purposes, and the team worked really hard and did it got it ready July the 1st through automation it was ready now that wow. that will be that product need to deliver the ongoing solution for that but for this year for the first six months from July to December we were able to produce something that's not going to be a long-term solution but we did it we can test it you can practice it and then build the right thing in the product so we're, we're able to do things like that and it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a forever process. So I think long answer to your question, that's what I'm most proud of, that it's still, it's still going. Oh, that's fantastic, Ellen. And I think, as I said, you know, definitely a pragmatic approach towards delivering this. And I, and I, I can imagine that you know, operations teams all over the world are grappling with this challenge of you know this automation challenge with the you know the advent of the, the you know the more advanced AI. So mm. you know the incremental things that you guys have been able to achieve you know, seem um, to have delivered the value that you were looking for, yeah. which has been fantastic. So yeah, I mean, I guess one final question for me to, to you, Eleanor, is what's next? What's next on your on your horizon for you know the sort of things that you will do with automation? I think for us the the really nailing down that customer interaction so you know where we've done we've proven ourselves in the processing that's not a live interaction or a customer interaction it you know we, we've got time to put it through a queue mm -hmm. i think the next thing would be how do we have that that email or whatever the new way to talk to us whether it's an agent bot which becomes a, a, um, a live chat, which could become a phone call, which could then become, you know, document sharing. I think that is that enhanced customer experience. So when you start to when you finish, we're, we're able to resolve it and you don't need to then follow up anymore. I think that's probably where we need to head to. Um, but designing that would have everything integrated would yeah. you know it's going to take a bit of time so that would be you know that's our where we need to head to yeah and i think Elena, you know that's the exciting thing about the phase we're in in yeah. terms of where you know the impact technology can have on what we do day to day and i think um yeah. you know if we had this conversation in five years time we'd be amazed at what it's yeah. able to do and what you've already you know been able to deploy within the organization similar to the yeah. same conversation we would have had five years ago to now you wouldn't have thought that you would have achieved as much as 
you know, Core Logic has using, you know, automation and the journey you've been on. So yeah. listen, thank thank you so much for taking the time and sharing that fascinating story with us. Because as I said, mm-hmm. every every operations team is going through something similar in terms of how do they um, use these technologies that are available to them in order to deliver, <clears throat> you know, a great experience for their customers, but also while doing that, trying to make sure employees come along the journey. So it's a fascinating to hear the steps that you've been through and that, you know, that I guess the dilemmas that you've experienced, mm. experienced on the way, along the way. So thank you very much for sharing that story. Um, so also thank you very much to uh, our listeners for joining us. Um, and please do check in some more episodes of Ops Game Changers to hear more fascinating insights from other leaders um, in the field of operations about how they've overcome challenges to drive that productivity and boost performance at their enterprises. So thank you for listening and bye for now. Today's Ops Game Changes podcast was brought to you by ActiveOps. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You can do that by sharing them on our Facebook, LinkedIn, or X feeds, or you can comment in the comment section of the YouTube version of this podcast. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, please do like and subscribe and check back in soon to hear more valuable insights from other inspiring leaders in operations. Thanks again for listening and goodbye.